Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency Region 1, which encompasses all of New England. As the agency's top official in New England, Curran has worked with elected officials and citizens alike to protect the environment. He's the first Region 1 Administrator to connect with citizens using Twitter in a move to make government agencies such as EPA more open and accessible and to facilitate dialogue regarding regional environmental issues. Previously, Kurt was the Executive Director of Save the Bay, a Rhode Island-based environmental advocacy and education organization with 20,000 members nationwide. During his 20 years as Save the Bay, at Save the Bay, he established the Narragansett Bay Keeper and Habitat Restoration Programs, which help to connect the communities with Narragansett Bay. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Kurt Spalding. I'll just sit down in front. I looked a little more uncomfortable than standing <laughs> up trying to do a few remarks. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Vivian for letting me come over and, and do this. Uh, Boston Harbor Associates is uh, really looked at as a much different kind of advocacy organization in that they take a systemic view of what they do, which is really a trailblazing kind of position. And that's the way they've always done it. So I want to congratulate you on the event. and. Again, uh, very pleased to be here. I thought I'd uh, say a few things about what is going, what has happened here in Boston. As was just said, uh, I've been in this business an awfully long time of cleaning up estuaries and harbors. I ran Save the Bay for 18, 20 years, something like that. And before that, I was there uh, working on policy and infrastructure investments and. Boston is an incredible story. I think if some of you have been to Providence, you'd see a, another story of, of uh, a rethinking about what estuaries and cities are about and, and that, that relationship. Uh, great things have happened here. Uh, for our 40th anniversary, when they asked to pull a panel together of leadership around the country to ask what was some of EPA's greatest achievements, Boston Harbor was on that list. That's what's happened here. Of all the things EPA has done over 40 years, and we can go all over this country and see amazing stories of, of environmental cleanups and, and uh, air quality getting better and land being restored, Boston Harbor's near the top of the list. So we need to put that, put this in the context. The history here is, the recent history here on environmental work is just uh, one that is cited all over the world of, of how we got here. Clearly, you heard from Doug Foy last night. There was a big story. Doug, Doug can tell the story probably better than anybody. Um, I will say that you know, around New England, there were some places a little ahead of Boston. I make that claim. Not a problem. We were a few years ahead of you. Uh, but now, what's here is is incredible. I've been out to Deer Island. I've, I've seen what kind of capabilities been added to this system, and it's it's really astounding. But I think what is most important when you look backwards about what's happened here, it, it's, there's been a transformation in thinking. Uh, I'll share this uh, impression I had. You, you recall we had a lot of snow this winter. Yeah. Remember that today, but there was a lot of snow, and the snow had to go somewhere. And historically, people dump the snow in lakes and estuaries just because we got to get rid of all this snow. And well, what is, if it's not good for getting rid of snow, what is it good for these water bodies? Well, you know, that momentum was starting to build. How are we going to get rid of all the snow? And, and the mayor um, said, no, we're not going to dump our snow into Boston Harbor. Now, I could make a pretty good argument that if you went all the way out to the end there, um, to the port, you could probably dump the snow in Boston Harbor and the environmental impact might be very small. Uh, if you dump it up on the uh, uh, wetlands and, and the salt marshes, I can tell you it would be very big. But he said, no, we're not going to dump the snow in Boston Harbor because we don't dump things in Boston Harbor anymore. That was, yeah, that was the mindset. Completely different idea than, oh, we can use this water body as a, way, as a place to dispose of our waste. And I think that speaks to a, an alignment around sustainability, uh, a more systemic view of, of how uh, the harbor, the coastal ecosystem, and the economy and the place that was just discussed has been realigned in, in Boston. Uh, a, a very fundamental transformation in understanding. Uh, cornered on the idea of, of sustainability. So we, we've seen, I think, a, a, a change 
that um, perhaps it's happened, it's happened elsewhere to some degree, but nowhere to the degree it's happened here, where what is Boston today is, is fully aligned with the environmental quality of the resource that's out there. 20, 30 years ago, Boston Harbor was seen as a place to exploit for economic gain. Now Boston Harbor is seen as a place to enhance for economic gain. That's an enormous change in thinking that I think um, speaks to the work that's going on here. It speaks to the advocacy work, and it also speaks to the leadership that's gone before me in, in the regional office of EPA, at the state level, the governors, uh, the judges, uh, all of them, everyone, and all of you who are here today thinking about the future of, of this place. So I, I, I want to acknowledge that as perhaps, as much as the, oh, we built a wastewater plant, or we did this, or we relocated the outfall, or we built a new CSO tunnel, or we did all these things. Um, those are great, but they're just a sign of, of, a, of a rethinking of, of the situation and the alignment of, of both uh, the economic system and the environmental system working towards uh, a better tomorrow, a more prosperous future. Um, and that's what we're trying to do at EPA broadly is get folks to understand that it's, a, it's about alignment now. It isn't just about where you spend your money and, and how you're going to comply with the law. It's about aligning your economics and your environmental thinking. And that's what we see here is, is so important. And, and that's why I think Boston has now risen to a level of, of great cities in the world, um, certainly great cities in North America. You know, you think of San Francisco, you think of Boston, you think of Vancouver, you think of Chicago, you think of uh, New York. Uh, these are cities that have leapt ahead and are leaping further ahead as we go forward. Yeah, you may all know about Brookings studies about the five mega regions. Well, this is one of them. This is one of the most important places on the planet. I'll tell you a quick story. My wife is a, uh, a science, chief science officer at a startup, and you know, that startup is, is running its course. So she went to see some of the venture capital companies she sees, and they told her they're planning to start 18 businesses. They raised $800 million to start new life science businesses within the next 24 months in, in Boston. And that doesn't happen anywhere else. Well, it doesn't happen too many other places in the United States. And it's all about this. It's all about this alignment issue that's making it work. And that's been the transformation, I think, um, that, that's so important. Now, I, I can talk all day about specific environmental things. I'm not going to do that. But I want to talk about one other factor that's going forward. And, and what your challenge is, I believe, going forward. And it's about resilience in your system. We've worked hard to see infrastructure get built, and that infrastructure stretched very, very thin. Stormwater is a, is a major problem for this system. Um, we, I think it's no mystery that transit is a major problem for the system. Um, looking at the system and looking at how we can build resilience in the system uh, for the betterment of the harbor, betterment of the community, betterment of the economy, I think is where the conversation needs to go, and I hope that's what folks are going to speak to. There are new approaches. There's an exciting thing happening down in Quincy, where indeed a private developer is saying they're going to rebuild the infrastructure of Quincy, the stormwater infrastructure, the uh, electric infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure, to do a development that will, will bring jobs and prosperity to Quincy. Hopefully on the back end, that, that infrastructure will be bought out, and, and now Quincy's stormwater problems will be reduced. There's another idea out there called green infrastructure. Truly, um, and I, don't, you know, I, I claim I helped do this, you know, we build a lot of tunnels, we build a lot of fantastic treatment schemes. But I think as we, if you looked at what happened in Japan, and I don't think anybody, not too many people in the United States appreciate what that tsunami was all about. But that was an area from New York to Maine, completely devastated. Think about all that coastline from New York to Maine, completely devastated three miles in. It's amazing. So what, what are we vulnerable to? We have infrastructure that, take my tunnel in, in Providence, that I worked so hard to see create a CSO tunnel. It's about a three mile tunnel that stores two billion gallons of stormwater CSO. If something like that happened and that tunnel cracked, we're done. Not very resilient. We're trying to think about resilient ways to improve water quality and help, help uh, improve uh, city systems like what we have here. So our idea of green infrastructure, well, if, if we're putting our strong water back into the ground through green infrastructure, rain gardens and the like, that earthquake happens, that earthquake happens, well, some of it might get wiped out, but not all of it will get wiped out. So that's the idea of resilience and sustainability that I think has to reshape the conversation going forward. At EPA, we're having these conversations. 
uh, green infrastructure on the water side has been fully endorsed by the leadership of EPA. We're trying to figure out how to make it work within the Clean Water Act, uh, a piece of legislation that really doesn't think about resilience and sustainability very well. We're trying to make it all work in a very archaic legal structure going forward. And that's going to be our challenge. Someday we're going to have to refigure this stuff and take these values that I'm talking about today and make them work. So that's what I wanted to bring to you as, as thought pieces as you go forward into this panel. Um, the, the things that have happened here are astounding and it's creating prosperity. I mean, the fact is Boston is prospering again. It, jobs are being created. Unemployment's going down. I can tell you the rest of New England would love to have what's happening in this region happen, be happening elsewhere. Um, we've got struggles in other cities in New England. But I hope that the, what's the boat rising here will lift the rest of the, the region and, uh, and, and see this, this vision of, of how what was happened here can, can happen elsewhere. So thanks very much, Vivian, and I look forward to the panel. That's a hard act to follow. Kurt Smalling was very modest. He was one of the greatest leaders, certainly in Rhode Island, in terms of Save the Bay and what they were able to do and to, trans and to transform that area. And to have him now as a regional administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency in Region 1, as Lorraine Downey said, is extraordinary. Because not only will he be able to take what he learned in Rhode Island, but bring it throughout the region is just extraordinary. And Lorraine Downey, as we mentioned, who just introduced her, was the uh, on the original board of the WRA and, and she was at the, uh, the head of the City of Boston's <coughs> Environment Department, helped to create much of what we're talking about, from the concept of the Harbor Walk Public Access System to really helping to work together with the executive directors of the MWRA to shape the cleanup of Boston Harbor. So we have two incredibly strong environmentalists here today, and I just want to acknowledge both of right now. We're going to shift gears. We're going to have our next panel.